Okay, basically in Victoria and Africa, that's um, all right. My name is Nasuha. Okay, um, uh, I think I'm from um, International Islamic Committee. So I would like to ask because in Africa and in Asia, actually we have one similarity whereby once we have told your president in his face, whereby Africa is ruled by a broken man presiding at a broken society. So, actually, in Malaysia, we kind of having the same situation. So, how do we actually face this kind of person, and also how, how, uh, what is the approach that we need to take to uh, fix this broken society and fight against the broken man? Thank you. Okay, let's ignore what your name was just now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to try and, and draw if you don't mind. Yes. There are certain things that help. Yes. That help drawing. So that when you've got a professor who's, a, who's got a doctorate in the subject, if you draw, then you also sound clever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's one here that's open. And it's in blue, which is the right color for any political party. <laughs> I think the first question was, perhaps maybe to put it into context, is that we do govern the Western Cape, right? which is one of the nine provinces. It is the, from a GDP contribution point of view, now we're moving closer to the second, just behind Cape Ten, in terms of size of GDP contribution to South Africa. So it's not like we're governing a small parochial province. It's a massive province with the city of Cape Town, which if you've never been to Cape Town, or you certainly believe in heaven, or whatever your religious beliefs are, come to Cape Town and we'll, we'll confirm that there is a heaven on earth. <laughs> but here's the, the issue here. Your question was, as similar to the party here, actually our demographics are changing. When we won in Cape Town, we had 42% of the vote, of the popular vote, and had a seven party coalition within the same race-based context. That was in 2006. At the next elections in 2011, we got 60% of the vote in the same race-based context. And you could not sustainably argue the case that those who voted for the DA then were only from a particular race. 
if you went to Gauteng, so what's happening in South Africa is two parallel circles in some ways. Is you've got this rural sea that enclaves, sorry, an urban South Africa. 62% of South Africans live somewhere here and the rest here. The constitution as was written in 94, the, de the percentages were different because of Bantu stance, etc, etc. So what is now happening in South Africa is that the opposition parties are thriving in urban areas and the ANC surviving in rural areas. So if you think about elect, there are nine provinces in South, in South Africa. The most urban are Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, Western Cape, to a large degree, maybe Northwest to a small degree, are becoming more and more. The rural ones, Eastern Cape, Mpumalanga, and the rest. In those provinces, the ANC gets close to about 70%. So when you then take the aggregates in a proportional system, where they do badly in urban areas, you aggregate those, they end up at 62%. The highest the ANC has ever got was 70%, and they've been seeing a decline since then. The real challenge is if you went to Gauteng, where the most amount of votes come from. Gauteng is the smallest province in South Africa, landmass point of view. 12 million people live there, but it's the biggest voter turnout. So that's where all the action is. There, the ANC only got 53% of the popular vote, and we got 30%. Now, if you know the racial dynamics of Gauteng, it couldn't even begin to exist that 30% of the people who voted for the DA in Gauteng are white, as an argument. They would have to be diverse. The majority of our voters are, are black. Our problem now is that the majority of our public reps in parliament are still white, but the infiltration is still coming through. So that's, that's, that's the long-term project that you, we're working towards. But I think as a, as a change, is starting to happen. That in fact, we're seeing people who now ultimately interrogate the DA without the hindrance of race coming on board. And for elite, my former leader, Helen Ziller, often people would just, it was easy for the ANC to dismiss her as a white woman. Now suddenly, they don't find the same ease as to say, you are a black man. So they just have to resort to other tactics. No, you just represent white interests. Because now, actually, their propaganda is what we're up against. So I, I just wanted to bring that point as an important distinction. Your second question, I'm just answering the professor's question, and then I'll answer. You asked me about Troop B. When it was tabled, B had five components to it, and you could get scorecards. One of them was ownership. The other was procurement of goods, and then, uh, I can't remember what the other three, the ANC scorecard, because that's not my job. But, <laughs> or, the skills. For each of these, you would get points, right? The problem with the initial design is that it put 40% here. And the problem with this is that Companies who want to just give away ownership, it had other problems. Even in an engineered mechanism, it designed fronting. Mm -hmm. So what these big companies would do is they'd go find black people who would stay in their boards and say, here are the shares. You don't afford them, you can pay them over a period of time. But the compliance was here and it didn't help. Mm -hmm. So our argument is, I support the scorecard, except it must be, we must change the weightings in the issue. So for ownership, we argue the case that yes, ownership is important, but we must reduce it to 20%. We say, rather, let's talk about small business development. What if you made that a further 20%? You equated it with ownership. Because what you then do is you say, if your company is Chinese owned, for example, here, and you don't want to create fronty. Rather, you must say, okay, we'll go trade with Malay-based companies 
and I use the word Malay in a race-based term, to go out and create business in that space. But here, we go even further. If you trade with a small business in South Africa, because South Africa's economy is driven in the main by big industry, we want to try and diversify by adding a lot of micro enterprise. That's why I say rather than create another hundred black industrialists who will come out of this pool, create thousands of small businesses who are of different races. The majority of them will be black anyway, as we know that. But it will give companies big points for doing that. And there's a question about skills transfer. Sorry, my handwriting is awful. But here's another question. What if your investment was this corporate social investment, but that is targeted? So I come back to company A and I say to them, right, for your future, we want to propose that you sponsor so many kids through university. We would give you points for that. Or we said to you, we want you to build a school within a particular time. And if you build that school as a company that benefits poor kids, remember now we're dealing with poverty, we would give you points. So in essence, you are then forcing behavior that achieves the outcomes you want to achieve. In that, yes, your starting point is to say, yes, your intervention must deal with a historical legacy, but your prospects are such that they don't. The problem with the scheme is that all it did is that it forced all of these companies to only trade with government. And so they end up all competing for government tenders, they don't develop, they don't do anything. Whereas our proposal says, fine, and in fact, even the, for both parties, this legislation only deals with companies whose turnover is over 100 million rand. So, so it actually does not affect the majority of South Africans. It's just given that perception. But we want to ensure that we deal with the objectives that we want to see so that we build that non-racial society. So it's not just haphazardly saying, yes, we want to train champions, and let's just build fields and hopefully they'll come out. It's actually structured in a way that says, no, 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 no. You will go identify the athletes, you will train the athletes, and if you do that, we will give you the incentives to do that. So it's targeted, so there's some deliberate issues, so that we can achieve the outcomes you want to achieve in the long run. The, the, oh, in South Africa, the total amount of points you can get to be B, B compliance. This is another issue. To prove that you are really black owned, you have to have 105 <laughs> points. They're just points. And okay? this is for government contract. Yeah, for government contract. So that when I'm scoring you, if you can qualify for a government contract, I can say, oh, you are black owned, 20 points, or 40 points as the case. And you are, you develop women, 10 points. You develop, okay? Perfect. So, so, so that's how it works. But even if you include it here, you said, for me, the other new incentives are this. If you create employment for so many people, which is the headache in South Africa, because B deals have not created work. That's the problem. But what if I say, if the small business in fact hires a hundred people, we'll give you the point. Or if this company creates a thousand jobs, we'll give you the incentives. Because we want jobs. Because at the same time, you can ask the question, how many black South Africans are actually participating in the economy? That number, as far as those who are not participating, is on the rise. And you can't afford to have that happen. So I take the view entirely that says, in the long run, we want to put a sunset clause to this issue. And then say, in fact, what we want to see happen in South Africa is that the heroes in South Africa cannot be people who protect employees. They must be people who create employment. So we mature this to a tax regime that says if you, for example, if you go to Poland today and you create a number of jobs, you can get a tax holiday. And we want to put similar incentives to industry because our interest is in fact creating employment rather than the other way around. So this scorecard will be something I'll table to say, ultimately, the objective and the vision here is to build a fair society. That's, that's the long-term goal here. You, then there was a question about Africa and our speech on a broken man leading a broken 
society. I want to place into context where that speech came from, because we didn't just write it out of the blue. The president the year before had pretty much, the Constitution of the Republic says the president will appear in Parliament every term, once a term. I mean, if you go to the UK, he has to be there every week, if I'm not mistaken, for questions. Our president only has to appear every three months, and you have to send the question six weeks ahead of time, so he can play his mind. And then when he comes, he just answers those questions, and then you have three follow-up questions. So it's really like paint by numbers, in my humble opinion. <laughs> And he said, look, Parliament is disruptive, the EFF are there, I just simply won't come. And we wrote to the President, we started to protest, and he simply just said, I'll go deal with communities. And literally, South Africa was going one way, and it wasn't a good way. And I was personally angered by that. So when we delivered the speech, it was out of a place of saying, you are breaking our constitution now, and you are breaking our country. It was simply not, I didn't even address him disrespectfully, although I called him a dishonorable man. But I wanted for us to be clear that we didn't want to mince our words when we spoke to him on the day. But I agree with you. It must be a celebrated part of our constitution that we can do that. I mean, last year, we put an advert on television that said the ANC is no longer the same. They're just a bunch of corrupt people. And that was on television, then they banned it, then it went on YouTube and got more hits anyway. <laughs> so, so there's some technical things, once you ban something, it helps. So that's where the speech came from. But your question about how do we fix it? To sound reductionist, you have to vote out the broken people. But, to complicate the answer, is you've got to uphold Institutions of government that are designed to hold, to fight against power abuses. I think I learned last night that Malaysia and South Africa have got similar constitutional provisions for your prime minister and your president, which in some ways are short-sighted. Because in South Africa, the president can elect the national director of public prosecutions, can elect, can appoint them without any parliamentary process, literally, I want that person to be the National Director of Public Prosecution. And as I said last night, no president is going to elect someone who's going to prosecute them. <laughs> so they'll pick people who are their friends. So how do you amend those constitutional provisions so that you fight against abuses of power? One of the key problems in South Africa is that the president has the power to appoint judges at the end of the day. And it's a process, yes. It has to go through, there's a... Um, uh, Justice, uh, Judicial Services Commission, which interviews them, is chaired by the Constitutional Court judge. But even the Constitutional Court judge is appointed by the President. And he, the President sends four delegates to that whole uh, committee, plus their ANC caucus. So the majority of people are going to agree with the President in the committee anyway. By the time it gets to me as leader of the opposition, I get a list of four names, and I have to recommend one to the President. So I looked through the list, and it could just as well be me, 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 more. But I think about it. We research the people. We write a substantive response to which the president can ignore and choose someone else in the same list. And then once he's done with that, he can load the bench with his own people. And sorry, this is the last diagram I'll draw. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. But this is important because <laughs> if I don't deal with this issue, it will be a problem. The NC has this thing called the National Democratic Revolution, which seeks to control all the arms of government. One of them is the judiciary. The other is broadcast, all of those things. So it's their mandate. Our job is to build the constitution on the other side. And we believe there are parties that will fall this way and parties that fall that way. We've got to protect these, and that's my word. Really, I go to Parliament to fight for the protection of the judges, etc., etc., and many of those things. Which I think answers your question, which was about how do we fight against the same issues. The fundamental goal is to build a governance model that proves the case. Because the most moral thing we can do in a modern-day democracy is to govern well. Because if we don't govern well, we prove the point anyways. 
So one of the things we do in the Western Cape, because we fear the voters, we don't have records of corruption, we protect institutions, and where you govern well, you prove that in fact you can fight against race-based policies. Because if you govern well for everybody, then people can appreciate that. And electoral support is rewarding us for that. And that's why we hope next year to grow in key cities, because South Africans need at the moment. And that's what, as a black South African, to reverse the story a little bit, as a black South African, what attracted me to what is the so-called white party is the fact that I believe that the future for South Africa was a question about good governance. And if you can prove to me the case for good governance, then you can proceed. That's why the opposition here in, Sil in Silango and different parts, they can't afford to not govern well there. Because believe you me, if you get into government and then govern badly, the voters punish you even more. Which then means you'll defeat the opposition faster than anything. All right? Thanks, sir. Before I bring you in, uh, I believe, uh, I think we should open, I, I think we should just open the, the, for another round of questions. Does anybody, that point about, you know, a black person joining a white party is really interesting about uh, how uh, ethnicity should not matter when you're choosing a party. I have been thinking about joining the MIC, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Indian Congress, right? Oh! <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Okay, so let's open up another round. Uh, let's go Alan first, uh, and then we'll go there. Yes, okay, Alan. Sir, um, it's, it's happening what you talked about, how governance plays such a key role, you know, in, 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 in getting your message across. Um, one of the documents that uh, your party has issued is it talks about firewalling key institutions. Could you perhaps elaborate a bit on how you have done it? examples of some examples of how it has functioned and uh, the results of it. Okay. So about firewalling key institutions, please. Hi, uh, my question is twofold, so if, please feel free to draw, if not illustrated your fingers. Uh, my first question is, as the leader of the opposition in South Africa, and you do govern the Western, the Western Cape, what has your experience been the national opposition, but at the same time running a province that is, you know, Cape Town, that contains Cape Town. I think that's an experience some of us Malaysians living in Slango, Balantan, or maybe Penang would be able to relate to. And how does that carry the national agenda for the opposition, number one? Number two, hitting to the question as liberalism as a force against racism. You mentioned this whole anecdote about not liking speaking Afrikaans and also how it's is, is protected under the Constitution. Understanding that no one here is politically naive and real politics plays an important part of politics within the votes. What do you think is the next step for South Africa and maybe something that Malaysia can learn or Malaysia can share with regards to recognizing that there will be differences in terms of how people believe in the spectrum of politics? For example, speaking Afrikaans or not speaking Afrikaans. And how is an opposition that champions liberalism Acknowledging the fact that you might have people that are not keen about liberalism, but you, it's important for you to engage with them. And how do you bring the country forward? Thank you. So how, how do you bring people together? Can we take a third question? Uh, let's take from Prem. Uh, so they will come to you later on. Please, Prem. Yeah, uh, it's quickly yeah. moving away from politics to party building, right? I mean, the AAC is a very strong political party. Uh, historically, you know, the legacy of Amela, etc. You are facing having to build a party as a party, in areas where there's a lot of mainstream racial tension and racial anger. How do you go about building the party, you know, when there's class difference and the within the party? Okay, okay. Uh, let's stop there, otherwise there'll be an abundance of questions. I will come back for another round. If you go quickly through the answers. I need to lay some foundation. Okay, okay. Please. On, on, on the wrong point, right? Uh, the wrong <laughs> I'm overruling my own. Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. The, the first question was about firewalling institutions. Now, that's our, that's our mantra in Parliament. So, for example, one of the key institutions that we have to protect is an institution called the National Prosecuting Authority. Because, I mean, I know it sounds like a bizarre concept, right? But, like, it's possible that the state could rule against you, find a charge, send you to prison for six years. It's possible. So, we see that in South Africa as a possibility. And we're arguing the case to say, like now we've taken the National Director of Public Prosecutions to court to say that the decisions were irrational. <coughs> so on any given month as a party, I have about 
16 court cases that we are making sure that constitutional principles are enshrined. That's one of the fights that we do. And that document really also gives a mandate to the people of South Africa about how we do it. And educating people about constitutionalism. Because only four out of 10 South Africans know that we have a constitution, let alone protecting the constitution. So we've got to spend our time educating, but also fighting in parliament and setting the agenda for it, etc., etc. So the courts are a key thing, civil society is another key thing, and then ultimately about grassroots mobilization is another key thing. So the second question was, how do you deal with the national agenda whilst in fact you've also got to deal with the tension of being the broad church, is how I like to define it. In any political party, of course you are going to find people who, we don't set an ideology test, but we sometimes don't subscribe to everything that we stand for. But there are some key things that we do. One is for public reps, the selection of public reps does not take place by me as the party leader. So I don't sit somewhere with a few of my friends and say, who do we want there, who do we want there, who do we want there? No, we don't do that. We firstly advertise. Secondly, we have a test, an online test that our public reps have to do. There we test for ideology. What do you believe about certain things? We then set a written exam, actually, that they must write an exam to prove to us that they can argue a point in parliament. And it's tough, because actually it means sometimes some of the people who have been on the streets with us fighting the cause don't end up in parliament because we don't believe government must be a golden handshake for people who have been in the trenches with you. So we want the best for government. And then we have an interview process, and then once the interview process is done, I get a list, and then with our federal executive, we can only adjust that list by up to 10% by moving people up or down that list. That's it. So we get people in parliament who understand our principles and our values, and they have then the job to go out and communicate that. But the second point is about mass mobilization. So the growth in Gauteng, for us to get into the 30% in Gauteng, where the biggest province is, you pick the right issues. So the issue in Gauteng was tolls, e-tolls. And I know here in, Mal in Malaysia, You've got too many, I'm sorry. <laughs> so clearly the opposition wasn't working here. It wasn't that big tolls. They are the most expensive thing in the world. But we had them in South Africa. We started to fight the battle. And they've installed them in South Africa. But only 10% or 15% of the people pay for the e tolls. The rest don't pay. So it's worked out that we fought the fight. But when people electorally came out to vote, they said, these people are fighting our cause. Therefore, we'll reward them. Then the last thing is the point I made earlier about good governance. If you govern badly, voters will punish you. So we've got to prove the case for good governance. And then the last issue, oh, it was exactly that about how do we build the party movement. And our infrastructure says, we've just launched a thing now called Vision 2029, which if you, if you go on our website, you can pick it up. And it's a vision for South Africa. And what we're saying is that on the basis of values, we can work towards, towards that vision. And uh, the second issue is, Actually, there's a strong temptation to believe propaganda. And sometimes people think that propaganda is the truth. It's not the truth. Enough South Africans believe in the dream for non-racialism. They do believe it. The problem for the DA has been that we haven't been able to get to the people. So I spend a lot of my time making sure our party is activist based. So our public reps are assessed at the end of every year whether they've engaged people in communities. More than anything, 70% of their assessment, like every year, everyone has to reapply for their job after every five years. You don't get automatically elected in the DA. You have to reapply for it. But one of the assessment criteria is that we've got a performance and development management system that we monitor every year that makes sure people are doing the work of activism. Because once you sit with someone in the lounge, they don't respond to propaganda as easily as someone you just leave and hope that they vote for you. Because then they can see, our voters, as an example, are critical of the DA when only black people march. They say, no, we want a party that is for all South Africans. So for example, now I've just gotten into a fight with one of our white MPs, to use an example, and black public, black public, 
have been fighting with me about the issue to defend her, and they don't even like her. But the principle of non-racialism is so entrenched that they fight for it. So when it comes to um, this issue of how do we build consensus, we don't build consensus on everything. We build it on just a few key principles that are agreeable. Everything else is nuanced. So even this issue about triple BWE, I'm sure there are people in the DA who don't agree with our view on it. But that's fine. As long as we agree that there must be the rule of law, there must be non-racialism, there must be the professionalization of the state, the defense of the constitution, and advancement of a market-based economy, then we're fine. All the minutia of issues will debate. I mean, land reform, all sorts of debates happen in the party. We don't always find consensus, we try, but the job of me as a leader is to make sure the beds of the river remain intact, so that we know what direction we are going into. If you try and get consensus on even 20 items, you will never lead the political party, because to get people to, I can't even agree with my wife on 20 <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, Sudip, yeah, let's see this out. Ah, my name is uh, My question is uh, making the assumption that one day you'll be president of South Africa. Because, <laughs> <laughs> and that does happen in terms of the, the education perspective. Now, in Malaysia, we have this issue whereby we've got still existing generations of people who have grew up under the colonial British master's education system. Then you had the hybrid where they have a bit of mix of both, and now really fully entrenched. And so they are coming with different references. Make an assumption that South Africa is going to perhaps <coughs> a similar kind of system whereby you know you've been educated by colonial masters in the past, and then there are some who are still living on that premise, and then there are some that are now there's a hybrid period, and then maybe the future will be a very different. Period. One of the key issues when you look at the whole world when it comes to these kind of things, particularly in Africa, where the colonial masters are kind of, I would say made a whole mess, it's the issue of history. And I believe that history should not be a subject in the education system because it's politically managed. It should be independent. My question to you is, if you want to go on your value system, you want to go on your, you know, having a very, uh, people accepting each other, all the values that you actually put forward, how are you going to do that? In the context that if you, if you were becoming the president, what would you think? Because right now in Malaysia, Big chunk of civil source are the teachers who actually grew up in a very different system and they are now. So, what are your thinking and thoughts? Thank you. Okay. Uh, General? Hi, uh, good evening, Simamani. Uh, uh, to keep mentioning 30%, which means your humble expectation is not to get too much of the votes. Uh, as DA, and you see Vision 2029, which means it's a long wait for the presidency that you just mentioned. <laughs> so my question is, this long way may not be in your favor because Mugabe was from the trenches and ANC is using the trenches history to consolidate the president. What is your strategy to fight this racial, uh, racial populism ANC in order to bring that majority of the rural one out of that mindset and be comfortable are you using Mandela as your icon? Or are you using uh, just the values? So the values is good, but it's, can people hold on to it generally and say that this is the new South Africa? Thank you. Okay, the next one. Yes, sir. I, I can't help but drawing some distinction between the division lines in relations between the Chinese and the late. In uh, South Africa, it's quite civilized, but also in relation, we have another division line. The one of religion. By definition, in Malaysia, uh, Malay is a Muslim uh, by, by constitution definition. So, uh, you have, I assume that blacks are Christians and not Christians. Can you shed some light on the religious division? Okay, right, let's go for another round of answers. Yes, sir. The question about history is, is, is not only about. It's also about national symbols and what gets celebrated. Because what gets taught in the classroom is one thing. And I agree with you, history, the, the, in history, the story of the hunt is always told by the hunter, not the hunted. Because they are the heroes, right? Or the lion, not the others. So that's the one reality. 
but there are questions of symbolism and what you choose to celebrate. Half of the reason I'm here for a short trip and not going on to other places is because going back to South Africa will be the second anniversary of the passing of President Nelson Mandela, who was an ANC president, nobody's disputing that. But there's symbolism that we can build in that. And so I'm going back there to talk about that very subject. Key days in the country, like Freedom Day, etc. We commemorate, even though some of them were ANC driven, we've got to do that. Where we've got to monitor is that the state doesn't capture those for its own benefit, which they do anyway. But we've got to set up parallel events and celebration. One of my big headaches next year is that before the elections, the first half of the year in South Africa is littered with public holidays that are deep and symbolic. Now you must deal with that. I think there are other things that we've got to do. So for example, where we govern, one of the symbolic things in South Africa is about street names and all of those things. Or naming of buildings and airports, etc. So we've got to be intentional about who we pick because it demonstrates to the people of that country that we are not a historical, but we also understand prospective names that we want to build that speak to our vision of that country. So I think we mustn't just look at history narrowly through what is in the classroom. We must also look at it through other symbolism as well. But the second point is, so if I took over as country, I'd want to make sure that the symbolic days are actually designed for the purpose of nation building. So I wonder whether or not one of the key initiatives is to take rugby, which is a historically white sport, and force that on certain days they must go play in a black township. Because that builds integration, force it, and reward them for it if you want. So, so there must be a thinking about how do you create a social dialogue about integration. The other issue is, even for me personally, South Africa must recognize that it forms a, it's within a global context. And I think that's one of the challenges that South Africans tend to deny. Whether I like it or not, it's unsustainable for a child to do their PhD in Kosa or Zulu, which is one of the African languages, because they've got to compete with England, etc. Whereas the global forces are forcing us. South Africa is a very open market, and we've got to respond to it. And I think if Julius Malema gets his own way, I think he'll shut the economy and nationalize it, which is dangerous. We've got to open it, which means if you open it, you've got to compete with global forces, which actually means some of your domestic uh, factors get affected by international variables. And we've seen it in the mining sector. Many of our companies, I mean, I, at the hotel I'm staying at is Nando's. There's a Nando's there, which is our gift to you. <laughs> But those are global variables. We are in a globalized environment. Just like we'll have to deal with climate as a question. That's a global issue. Just like we're part of the BRICS, that's a global issue. But unfortunately, foreign policy in South Africa doesn't get discussed as much, and we've got to be able to entrench it. I think much more in South Africa. For the role that we play as an entry point into Africa, we've got a crucial point. And I think if I listen to the President's State of the Nation address, maybe foreign policy has one or two lines not good enough. Quite frankly, I think on balance, there must be a lot more foreign policy to help South Africans understand that we are part of a global society. The second issue is I want to give the numbers context. I mentioned 30% because it's in Gauteng. If I reflect on the growth of the DA, so Johannesburg, Last elections we had about 22%. When I stood in 2011, we grew to about 35%. So your growth isn't always incremental. So don't, I'm not making the assumption that next year we'll grow by 4%, then 5 then. If we do that, I agree with you. There will be no South Africa to contest for. So we have to force change and force it fast. The ANC's numbers are actually in decline. In real numbers, there are less people today voting for the ANC than there were in 94. In real numbers. That's why I say, the only way they're winning the majority is the Mugabeification 
the winning of rural communities rather than... So what we've got to do is I agree, we must win in the urban areas. Fortunately, the EFF also has some good prominence in rural communities, so they're going to break that. But if I come back to this diagram, can you see that I'm using the time from the last question? <laughs> <laughs> the ANC can't keep the broad church. Because in the ANC, there are people who support this vision and there are people that support that vision. And the two visions literally are opposed to each other. So the ANC is going to split even further. So they can't keep... Because in the ANC, you can't have people who support this and support that. It just cannot work. Already, give you an example, before I left to come here, there were ANC students marching against the ANC about an ANC policy. Already that gives you the tension. The ANC as an alliance has got unions to it. Already they fired one of their biggest union constituencies out of the party. And all that's left is COSATU, which is another union of the ANC, but that's got less members and declining every day. So the point is, this project here, is not sustainable. The only way the ANC will stay into power is not by governing well, is learning the tricks from here in Malaysia <laughs> about how to stay in power for longer. So, so that's what we say. I think the question about religion is, is, a, is an important one because I think South Africa doesn't have as much of a religious South Africans are religious, but they are not fundamentalists or fundamentally so. I mean, uh, you were telling me a story about in Indonesia, or perhaps maybe even here during Ramadan, you shut shops in Indonesia. They don't sell alcohol. In South Africa, you couldn't be able to tell whether it's Ramadan or not. <laughs> even though there's enough of a Muslim population. 70% of black South Africans are Christians, but they don't think policies must influence the constitution. So for example, even though Christians may hold a view that homosexuality is wrong, it's still part of our constitution in the sense that civil union is protected in the South African constitution. Religious groups may argue that for example, on abortion, there must be the protection of life, so there can be no pro-choice. But in South Africa, even in a religious context, pro-choice is still a legal framework. So I think South Africans are more constitutionalists than they are religious in this regard. The only problem, and I don't think it's a problem, but it's just that's how religion expresses itself in South Africa, is that there's an importing of the Middle East crisis into South Africa. So what happens there is that there is starting a little bit of some tension between Muslims and Jews. So much so that the ANC, about a, a, last month, invited Hamas into South Africa and hosted them. And obviously that wasn't our position in South Africa, the South African Parliament is a two-state solution. Why is the ANC acting in a biased manner? But they are doing it so that they can mobilize on the basis of race. And they are trying to now introduce a new layer, which is religion. And importing a conflict that doesn't exist in South Africa. And South African Jews, we even have some shops where there are attacks where even for Jews, you might find a Muslim radical group putting a peak in a fairly Jewish shopping center for the purpose of offense. And we are seeing that a little bit more. But it's really in pockets and it doesn't affect the national discourse. But its consequences are so that for the purpose of the ANC to mobilize on the basis of another variable or the second R, which is, you know, you talk about the triple R, race, religion, and royalty. We've only got race as a cocktail, religion much less so. And when it comes to royalty, that's starting to increase from the perspective that traditional leaders are given more power and we're trying to fight that individuals must have more power. So I think that's where religion plays a factor in South Africa. It is not a big deal at this point in time. I mean, I can stand 
as a Christian leading a liberal party. And yes, we have had some criticism about the issue, but amongst the electorate, it's a non-issue. So we wouldn't even have a constitutional provision that says in this state, this person who leads this state must be of this religion. It doesn't exist at all. Anyone can stand. And uh, at the opening of any function, there isn't even a religious prayer. There's just a moment of silence, prayer, meditation, and people can do what they want to do. Good. Uh, can I just quickly uh, ask one uh, question from what you said just now? Uh, it's really interesting that you spoke about this commitment to market economic system. Uh, and, and coming from uh, the, the black community with all the historical legacy, usually liberalization of the economy and market economic system is something that, you know, the, people would assume that you would be against it. Uh, because it will force competition and therefore the likelihood is you will lose out. Uh, of course, I'm not referring to Malaysia at all here. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, the fear is the, uh, those with a historical legacy of being left out will lose out in the market economic system. But you seem to be committed to that. So how, how do you justify uh, this too? I guess the question is, is good or bad in comparison to what? If you give me the alternatives, I don't think the alternatives work. The alternative is Zimbabwe. And that has excluded a lot more people than any other thing. But, if we think about South Africa's macroeconomic framework, there have been five to this day. The first one was the Reconstruction and Development Program, which was adopted by President Mandela. In fact, when President Mandela left prison, he thought nationalization would work until he went to Davos. Came back with a different economic suite. The second economic policy was a thing called TIA, which was the Growth Enrichment and Acceleration Program. That was very really market liberalization. And under GEAR, South Africa's economy grew on average at 5%. Secondly, under GEAR, we saw the debt level of South Africa decline. We saw a broadening of the increases growth. And against the backdrop of growth, we've got an opportunity for job creation. And when you look at the number of people that are employed in South Africa, we're creating more jobs when more people were liberalized, as opposed to the contrary. Good. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, is there any more really pressing questions? I hope not. Uh, but is there any more really burning question that must be asked, otherwise you will die? No? No, very good. Uh, can I uh, invite Moritz very quickly to say yeah. and I really want to close by asking Dr. Lee one question to bring us back to Malaysia. So, please Moritz. I wanted to thank you for having the event, if you want. Oh, uh, right. Just, and want to clarify one thing. It's the second time we speak, uh, we have liberalism in the title here, within two months. And in this room we had the president of Liberal International, also organized uh, by ideas. It's no secret the Furitama Foundation is a liberal foundation, so I want to thank you very much for being brave enough to put liberalism in your titles. Um, we talked about the DAP and uh, Mr. Maiman's visit there. Just to clarify, the De Democratic Alliance is a full member of Liberal International, and uh, Kiadilan actually is a soccer member of Liberal International, and he's had five appointments with uh, Kiadilan in the last uh, 48 hours, and the DAP was sort of a, a last edition and uh, that was a courtesy call at, at Parliament today, but mostly it's been uh, meetings with the Chief Minister of Silango, with uh, Manaziza, Nubaliza, and we will go to PPR headquarters also uh, tomorrow. Um, I also wanted to say one thing about the Vision 2029. I think there's a misunderstanding. Um, you're not going to wait until 29 to take over government. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the Vision 2029, and, and it's really worth to visit the website of the Democratic Alliance, is how South Africa will look like after two full terms of democratic alliance government. So the vision of what the country could look like after 10 years of a DA government. And I really urge you to, um, to uh, visit the DA website. Uh, they have a couple of video clips. Uh, it's very professional done, very well filmed, and it's very moving, and uh, it's powerful messaging. Please have a look. And thank you for coming, of course, uh, Mr. Momani. Thank you, Mr. Momani. important that we bring back the conversation. So just, just uh, two, three minutes, if, if you don't mind. 
let's come back to the situation in Malaysia and uh, let's see, you know, from all that conversation, the reason why I asked Dr. Lee to wait right to the end is, uh, after listening to all that uh, comments, you know, how do we bring this lesson back in Malaysia, especially in terms of creating this non-racial politics here? Well, just to clarify, the, the, the reason you're getting to the end is that everybody very wisely chose to channel all your questions to our uh, <laughs> distinguished uh, honorable uh, guest here, but that's okay. I'm the second child, so that's all right. Understood. <laughs> so I think that we'll be picking up on the question that was uh, raised earlier as, as well. Um, and I think, yeah, drawing uh, on this Malaysia and South Africa uh, uh, comparative uh, case. Some of it is already, I think, you know, in, um, in progress, and I think, uh, well, I, it's, we are in a situation of perhaps uh, wondering where we're going and, and, and the momentum, whether it, it's, it's declining, but we have seen over the last uh, five years, I mean, 2008, 2007, I suppose you could say as a, as, as a certain turning point, 2008 elections, uh, and, you know, of people galvanizing around common causes um, and yes, you know, wanting to capture a bigger vision beyond uh, race-based politics, asking the harder uh, searching questions. And so I think searching for that kind of common cause both from a you know, social, so wherever we are in, in our uh, place of study uh, and work, in, in, in our relationships and uh, communities. Um, whether that will translate into political uh, change, well, I'm not going to assume that everybody would want some kind of regime change, um, but it's going to be uh, quite different from the South African experience because of the electoral system as well that, uh, that I highlighted earlier. With a proportional system, we would have had regime change by now. <laughs> where, it, based on the popular vote, you know, the, the parties, uh, the, the, that uh, coalition gets to uh, form, form government. And, and that is uh, slanted against, or is slanted in favor of uh, the incumbent uh, coalition. So it will be still working within that system. Uh, I think combating further gerrymandering and, and unfairness uh, in the electoral uh, system, that will be you know, something that uh, has to be uh, on, I think, uh, political agenda for change. Um, and uh, reaching out, yeah, beyond just the urban enclave that we're in and you know, our uh, comfort zones. So that's why about common causes. And I think South Africa and, and Malaysia, you know, we talk about diversity, but I think the way that we actually uh, embrace it can be more enriching, can be uh, really also a means to break down the barriers and those race lines. Meaning, truly celebrate diversity and, and pursue it, not just an appeasement that we need quotas, but that is part of uh, who we are and something to be uh, celebrated and not just the food and you know those kind of um, cultural expressions but also in our, in our work, in our places of study and interaction. And not just also look at the conventional lines, oh, Malay, Chinese, Indian, Bumputra, but uh, disaggregate that, right? That there are so many within. What about language? What about region that you're, you're from? And diversity in terms of gender, in terms of urban and rural. I, I think, uh, you know, it, it, this is a, a certain ideal, I think that, but, you know, we can uh, strive towards that. I think in, in the process, we start to realize that, yeah, we're not all uh, the same, uh, even, you know, within Malay and, and Chinese and so on. And uh, the third one that I would uh, bring to, I think, our consideration is we could do with a lot more self-criticism. And I think what you have brought uh, to us today, the kinds of challenges that, that you face, you know, the, the barrage of um, criticism and attacks from, from uh, black South Africans, uh, which you had to uh, deal with. Uh, because you are 
prodding them in ways that make people be more comfortable. You're asking the harder questions that affect uh, black South Africans. I think in Malaysia we are there's a you know we, we put ourselves in certain stalemates because we do tend to uh, look from that perspective still. However much you know we yeah we, we the rhetoric may may uh, may be expressed uh, otherwise. For instance, schooling. Uh, you have, you know, it's a split about integration. Well, one side will accuse, oh, it's the government schools that are, um, you know, becoming mono-ethnic and they're the cause and, and the MARA programs and so on and the preferential systems. That's the cause of lack of integration. And then on the other side, it's, no, 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 it's not. Um, it's the, the vernacular schools. That's the cause of lack of integration. As though it has to be either one or the other, and, and it's an accusatory tone, it's a very self-righteous tone that uh, me and my community were okay, but the problem is the other, the other way. When, why can't it be both? Or in discrimination, and here I have a personal experience from research I've done that has uh, found uh, evidence of uh, discrimination, and we did it in the private sector, so it was primarily Chinese-owned companies you know, that, were, that we had found through actually sending applications to jobs and then we found that there was many more Chinese applicants called for interview than the Malay applicants. And 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 it, it triggered that similar thing. Oh no the the, the, the business uh, you know, the market doesn't discriminate, only the public sector discriminates. And then the retort predictably, no the public sector that doesn't discriminate, it's only the private sector that discriminates. Well try a bit of self criticism. Both do discriminate, and we can start with acknowledging that and really have a conversation about it in a way that doesn't have to blow up in our faces. I think we need to move towards that direction, and I think it begins with uh, everyone being a bit more self-critical, not just also about race, right, in gender and so on. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I think that that's a very important point about uh, you know, reflecting on ourselves uh, properly. And I learned a lot from uh, the, the presentation of both speakers. I am really going to use this word that you used just now, Mr. Manwane, Mugabification. <laughs> you know, that's a very interesting way. Uh, I can think of another uh, name. Uh, uh, when describing concentration of power, abuse of money from questionable sources, and so on, but I'm not going to mention that in here. Um, the, the, the point that you bring up about uh, you know, importation of issues of problems and uh, things from outside in order to benefit uh, you know, partisan interests is also another point that not many has raised. And uh, your example about how Hamas issues have been brought to, to South Africa is, is uh, you know, something that we should think about as well, and we should be cautious about how some people are exploiting international problems for partisan interests, uh, while at the same time using this facade of thinking about the wider issues. So uh, there are many uh, points I think we need to think about. Uh, it's already 10 o'clock, we should not be thinking too much right now. Uh, so, so let's stop there, let's give both speakers another round of applause.